There are a few pastimes that seem to appeal to people more than cycling. Practical for covering moderate distances, good for a bit of exercise, and gives people time out in nature. While there might be some risk from passing traffic or injuring yourself in a crash, it is generally safe and a low risk activity. But just because something is considered fairly safe, it doesn't mean that it is like ever totally free from danger. So we're headed back to the late 80s to look at how a seemingly normal bike ride turned from a regular daily activity into one of America's most baffling mysteries. Welcome to Bell in New Mexico. The year is 1988 and the date is September 20th. Tara Lee Calico is a 19 year old resident who's attending the University of New Mexico as a sophomore. Aside from her studies, she works part time in a bank. Known occasionally by her nickname Tartar, she is 5 foot 7, weighs around 120 pounds and has brown hair and green eyes. Described as always doing something, she seemed to have an endless energy and enthusiasm. This is why on that morning she set off from her home to complete a relatively long bike ride. The route she was going to take was a 34 mile trip that tended to take around 2 hours to complete. Her mother, Patty Dole, often cycled the route with her but chose not to that day. In fact, Patty had become a little more than wary recently after she felt that there were a few drivers on that route that may have been following them. She was concerned enough that she started advising her daughter to consider carrying something that could be used in self-defense. Some mace, maybe. But Tara just laughed it off and her concerns, which, you know, it's like, oh, I don't need to do that, and then set off around 9.30 in the morning to cycle along the usual route on a pink, huffy mountain bike. She had made arrangements to meet her boyfriend for lunch after the cycle and jokingly said to her mother to come looking for her if she wasn't back by noon. And with that, she set off from her home on Brug Street and pedaled off out to sight, armed with nothing more than her Walkman and a cassette tape to listen to. But as her expected time of arrival came and went, her mother began to worry. While it was a substantial distance to cover, since the pair of them had completed it very regularly, there was no reason that Tara would be late. Patty got into her car and drove along the route on the New Mexico State Road 47, looking for any sign of Tara or her bike. When she saw nothing to indicate that she was around or it was clear that she hadn't either made it home or really the planned lunch with her boyfriend, Patty called the local law enforcement and reported Tara missing. Which by the way, there's this really weird uh, misnomer that you can't report somebody missing for 48 hours. That's completely wrong. If you suspect somebody's missing, you can report them missing immediately. It's just if they're an adult that's missing, it's kind of a different story because it's like, well, they could like it's not illegal for you to go off and do your own thing and not tell people. But if it's a youngling missing, report it immediately because the cops will absolutely start looking into it right then and there. But the police were quick to set out and scour the area, see, 48 hours doesn't matter, checking all along the expected state route looking for any signs. Witnesses soon came forward to confirm when they'd last seen the young woman and her distinctive pink bike, with the last solid sighting being around 11.30 on the state road. All that was found, despite extensive searching, were the remnants of her Walkman by the side of the trail. An additional report from witnesses that said they may have seen like a light-colored truck possibly following her. Police initially questioned her mother and stepfather about whether it was possible that Tara had run away from home whether there were any issues at the house, or if she could have just gone off with someone somewhere without letting them know. But when they had been assured that this was unlikely and failing to turn up any more leads, the trail went cold and despite repeated appeals, there was nothing of note reported. As the days grew to weeks and then months, Patty and Tara's stepfather John began to lose hope that they'd ever find out what happened to her. It would be around half a year later and around 1500 miles away that a possible lead would present itself in the most bizarre way possible. On the 15th of June in 1989, a picture would be found outside a store in Florida that showed something a little disturbing. Discovered beside a van outside the store, the photograph was of a young boy and slightly older girl, both with duct tape across their mouths and their hands tied behind their backs. Unsettling enough on the face of it, but Patty would come to believe in this photo was Tara. When the police investigated, the woman who found the photograph gave a vague description of a man who owned the van, but a search of the area and series of roadblocks did little to turn him up. They contacted the company that made the photo paper, who confirmed it was of a newer type, not made before that year, proving that whoever was in these photos, they were recently taken. But Patty was not alone in this thinking. When the photograph was published to a nationwide audience on a TV show, many relatives and friends also thought that the woman in the photograph could have indeed been Tara. The identity of the boy also had some members of the public suggesting it could be Michael Henley, a nine-year-old who had gone missing from New Mexico just a few months before Tara. Michael, though, would be found dead a few years later and not far from where he had gone missing, essentially confirming that he was not the boy in the photograph. 
but this would not dissuade Patty, who was adamant that the photo was indeed of her daughter. The nationwide press that the disturbing photo got helped to propel the strange disappearance of Tara into the minds of the nation at large, and the intrigue would only grow from there. The FBI analyzed the photograph, oh thank god the FBI is here, and decided that they couldn't say for certain whether the girl in the photo was Tara or not. When it was checked by the Los Alamos Nation Laboratory, they seemed to conclude that it was not Tara. Scotland Yard, however, came back with the conclusion that it was in fact her. So three separate sets of very accomplished experts within high-level organizations had come back with entirely different conclusions. Patty was adamant, however, that she said that a mark on the girl's thigh matched up exactly with the scar that Tara had picked up in a car accident, and a book that was sat near her in the frame was one of her favorite authors. It seemed both to her and to some others that it was proof that Tara was still alive somewhere, albeit being held by someone. A further two pictures have been found that the Calicos suspected may have depicted Terra over the next few years, but investigators were fairly confident and unified in their analysis and conclusion that neither of these were her. In fact, by 2008, they also believed that the first picture didn't depict her at all either. So with the case firmly in the eyes of the public, there were a few conflicting theories that began to crop up. The first, when considering the photograph, was that Tara had been kidnapped and taken across the country against her will, that she was being held hostage by someone unknown, and that, at least for now, she was relatively unharmed. Others believe that she may have simply had an accident while riding along her route and came off of her bike in such a way that led her to being remained undiscovered. It was also still possible that she had, in fact, just taken off, decided that she wanted to be somewhere else, and just up and left without informing anyone else. But locally, anyway, there were a few more worrying theories that were starting to be spread around. One of Tara's former classmates, named Melinda Escobel, took an understandable interest in the case. She made a documentary series covering the disappearance, a podcast that covers all aspects of the case and generally seems invested in either bringing the killers to justice or solving the mystery somehow once and for all. Her personal theory on what happened seemed to tie in fairly well into another popular one. She believes that Tara was being harassed and followed by a group of locals. Boys around her own age, one of whom had asked her out on a date and been rejected. She believes it was this small group that was responsible for a harassing note allegedly left on Tara's car. And also, these were the boys that were driving the vehicle spotted tailing Tara on the day of her disappearance. Melinda believes that somehow these boys are responsible for her disappearance. Rather than the photograph found hundreds of miles away, after all these years of investigations and like hundreds of interviews, she believes that Tara never made it that far away from home. She may have been struck by a vehicle that was following her or the occupants accosted her in some other way, but it is her belief that Tara was killed by this group, either accidentally or on purpose the very same day that she left home on her bike. A deathbed confession of a local teacher would shed some more light on a prominent theory at the time and lead to further investigations. A man spoke to investigators shortly before he passed away in what may have been an effort to cleanse his conscience after more than 20 long years. In 2013, a man by the name of Henry Brown spoke to a deputy named Frank Mathola when he knew that he was dying. And the story that he told, if true, would answer all the lingering questions about the disappearance. According to Henry, around the time that Tara went missing, he was hanging out with some teenagers who were always getting into some sort of trouble. The ringleader, or at least one of the main characters, was actually the son of serving sheriff Lawrence Romero Jr., son of Lawrence Romero Sr., according to Henry, Jr. was involved in drugs, both dealing and taking them. It was also alleged that he was the one who was romantically interested in Tara, but she was already dating someone else and wasn't interested herself. Apparently, when they were all drinking together, Jr. and some others admitted to what had happened that day. They said that they had knocked Tara off of her bike and then the truck they had taken her a short distance away. After this, they assaulted her, and when she threatened to report them or go to the police, they ended up killing her. They stashed the body in the immediate aftermath, but after the search for Tara grew, they went and retrieved it, wrapping it in a tarp and storing it in a basement. Once the heat had died down, they disposed of it for good in a body of water. Seems like a fairly concrete statement and one that matches all the points to the mystery. And to add to it all, a second man came forward and said that one of the men involved had further confessed his involvement in the whole affair to them. Open and shut case then, surely, right? However, there are a few issues that stop this from being the solution that many had felt that it had been. 
The first and possibly like the biggest barrier to any real action being taken on the confession was that every single person implicated in the confession was already dead by the time this came to light. Lawrence Romero Jr. died in 1991, either in a game of Russian Roulette gone wrong, or he deliberately took himself out. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, Russian Roulette, usually, I mean, it always goes wrong for somebody, doesn't it? But even this had its own element of mystery to it. His father, Lawrence Romero Sr., was adamant that it was not him taking himself out and pushed to have it ruled as a homicide. The man that made the confession, Henry Brown, was a school teacher and said he was threatened into silence by the boys after they told him the details of what they had done. The only reason he eventually gave this version of events was because he knew he was dying and no retribution could come, and he was right. He died less than two months after passing on this information. The man who corroborated the story by relaying a confession of his own was named Donald Dutcher, a long-term resident of the area. He knew the boys involved at the time and Tara herself. He alleged that one of the boys came to him and said the following, Tara Calico talks to me at night. She asks why we did it. Much like the other boys, now men, the man behind the confession was involved in drugs and a heavy user. He ended up dying in 2000, and when Donald was interviewed about this in 2013, he said that Romero Jr. and Charlie Hewton, the man that allegedly confessed to him, were two of the four men involved. Charlie died of an overdose a year after Romero died from his self-inflicted uh, headshot, while Donald maintains that he doesn't know the names of the other two men. He was fairly certain, though, both of them were also dead. Drugs seem to have been a theme that ran through the entire disappearance. Even Tara's boyfriend, Jeff Abieta, was alleged to have been involved in both taking and selling various drugs. A second, even more sinister theme seems to run throughout the entire story when viewed through a deathbed confession of Henry and the account of Donald. Potential corruption. While neither of them put too fine of a point on it, it was at least heavily implied that the reason the investigation stalled out and went nowhere may have possibly been due to the fact that Romero Sr. was sheriff, and if reports are to be believed, he would cover up anything criminal that involved his son. Even Rene Rivera, who was deputy then and now sheriff, seems to have been smeared as being somewhat corrupt in some circles of the community. Henry's confession included the fact that Rivera would look out for them. In fact, there was even talk that after Romero Jr.'s death by gunshot wound, a full confession was found by the body. But this conveniently never made its way into evidence. There are more salacious allegations against Rivera in local forums, but none that are relevant to the disappearance of Tara. The picture that is being painted here is of a thoroughly corrupt group within the local law enforcement that did their best to suppress what happened. But even this comes with its own difficulties. If Rivera truly knew about all these things, if they suppressed the suicide note confession and helped cover up what happened, the statement they went public with in 2008 makes even less sense. Now the sheriff of Valencia County, Rene Rivera, stated that he believed two boys known to Tara hit her with their truck by accident, and in a panic, they killed her and covered up the evidence. Despite this though, and while stating that he knew the names of the boys involved, he was adamant he would not be able to make a case without recovering the body. This would be a bizarre stance to take if you were personally responsible for keeping a story suppressed, because you don't need the body to convict somebody. And doubly so when you consider how poorly received this statement was. Many, including Tara's stepfather, question why this was even put out there if there was no intention of making an arrest on the back of this information. Or really, what was the purpose of it in any meaningful way? While the analysis of various photos has brought up different results from different agencies, there have been more pieces of concrete evidence over the intervening years. Both Tara's parents have passed away in the years since her disappearance, but they kept a room for her at her house at all times, and hopefully, if she is gone, they are reunited with her at this point. Tara was declared dead in 1998, and her death was ruled as homicide by a judge despite her body never being found. Her mother died in the year of 2006, having never given up hope that someday finding out about what happened to her daughter. As well as keeping a room ready, she brought presents for her on the date of her birthday, always certain she would reappear and be able to enjoy them. As her own health deteriorated due to a series of strokes, she began to think that she saw Tara in her everyday life. John and Patty moved to Florida in the early 2000s. John also later passed away in 2022. The two of them died having spent years trying to keep the memory of Tara alive and pushing for more investigations and pursuing truth no matter what it would be. And they sadly passed on without any definitive answers to their questions. 
However, after 35 years without any real progress, the Valencia County Sheriff's Office held a conference in June of 2023 to announce that they had made some progress in the investigation, as well as executing a warrant earlier at a yet unnamed person's home. They seem to believe that they know the people involved in Tara's disappearance. Is there now a chance that this mystery will finally be solved? Time will tell. The FBI still has a reward pending for any information about this case, specifically anything that will lead to either her location or identification. Until there is some sort of conclusive end to the story, either by the arrest of a suspect or suspects, or by the recovery of a body, or even the reappearance of Tara after more than 30 years, there will always be an element of mystery to this case. One of the main points to consider is the relevance of the photograph that was found in Florida and any subsequent ones. It's impossible to decide if these really depict Tara or an unknown boy and girl if they just are something completely unrelated, especially when major investigative bodies can't seem to agree on who is actually in the picture. Ultimately, without the person who took the photograph of either the subjects being identified or speaking to the police, this will remain an unknown. If we take them as depicting Tara, then why she was pictured more than 1,500 miles away from where she went missing obviously is a little bit of a mystery. And what sort of captor would have the advance planning to carry out what looks like a double kidnapping and succeed in escaping nearly across an entire country, but simultaneously also being so careless as to leave the evidence of these crimes lying on the ground outside of a store? In terms of theories as to what happened to Tara, there is arguably the strongest case to be made by combining elements of a few of the more prominent kind of theories of what's happening. If we believe that she was being harassed or followed by a local group of boys, then that would explain why her mother was becoming concerned about stalking on their usual cycle route. It could also explain why a witness saw her bike being tailed by a group inside of a truck along the highway. Her broken Walkman and damaged tape can be interpreted in a couple of ways. Her mother always believed that this was Tara attempting to leave a trail for others to follow, deliberately dropping what amounted to breadcrumbs to aid those who would be setting out to find and rescue her. Although if she was in fact struck by a mysterious truck that was following her, either on purpose or accident, this would have also adequately explained the location and condition of these two bits of evidence that were found. And if she had been hit or otherwise stopped by this truck of the unknown group of boys, then it starts to look as though Melinda's theory about what happened to her former classmate may be most plausible. When you also take into account the confession of a dying man and the alleged ringleader taking his own life long after the fact, it's hard to deny that many of the elements start to kind of line up, and they seem to make a much more straightforward, if terrible, narrative. After all, which is more likely, a young woman who was kidnapped and transported across the country, photographed several times and always remain undetected and unfound, or that her life was taken either the very same day that she disappeared or shortly after by people that already knew her and had issues with her? The theory seems to hold the most water, but it also raises a fairly awkward question, at least for members of local law enforcement. Some of the theories that were whispered about at the time named a particular individual as being part of the group responsible, a young man whose father was involved in the local police force. If this was indeed the case, then it seems possible that the investigations were either hampered or directed a certain way to shift blame. How likely is it that really that degree of corruption could have infiltrated the ranks of investigative teams? Or on a more basic level, how far would a man potentially go to protect his son? I think... Allegedly, we all probably know the answer to this. No one has been specifically named in the most recent press conference held about the case, but the very fact that there are now new leads after so many decades of nothing is surely promising for those who simply want the mystery solved. Until there are arrests made and what the police have actually found is unsealed, it is really up to each of us to decide what we think. Did Tara Calico leave her home that day with a plan to run away somewhere? or? Has she just been living her life for all that time? Or did something more horrific happen to her? At least for now, we can't know. Maybe after all these decades, all the speculation and the photographs, there might be some answers in the not too distant future. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then please leave a like as it gets the video out there. And subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. I want to thank my patrons real quick. At the Literal Wendigo tier, we have Grayson West. Thank you, sir. Then at the Eyewitness to the Event, we have Beaver Malaga and wet skeleton <laughs> okay thanks guys and then at the first hand accounts we have 
Cody Cherry Drake, and secondhand accounts, we have Cannon Johnson, Fred Rush, Justice Davis, and Troy. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping this channel running and is greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see you all in the next one.